you know, I, I did a lot of traveling in, uh, in Europe, um, touring with this Lebanese oud player and with some very avant-garde jazz players and, and on my own, uh, doing some solo gigs and, you know, all different kinds of stuff. And one time I uh, played some gigs in Poland. Uh, I was driven from the Warsaw Airport down these incredibly bumpy roads uh, to a, a club in a town whose name I cannot pronounce. But uh, I remember that two of the towns on the way to the gig, one of them was called Topolova, <laughs> Topolova, and the other one was Gagolina. I thought that was really funny. <laughs> First you Gagolina, then you Topolova. You have too much to drink. I'll never forget it. And, uh, and this town was called something like Wroclawec or something like this. Uh, unpronounceable. I might have gotten it right. And there was this, this guy who had a blues club there. And he wanted me to play solo. And so I came in and did. And uh, one of the tunes I played was Summertime. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did it on piano and harmonica. And uh, I'll do it a little bit for you. And then there's a surprise ending of the story, too.
Hmm. Yeah, I just decided to take off on it a little because I, I remember <laughs> I did that there. Uh, there's actually a, a YouTube video of me playing it there. And it was really wild. I, I didn't watch it for many years until finally I said, okay, I'll watch this because I usually don't like watching stuff I've recorded that someone randomly filmed on an iPhone, you know. I had this experience talking with him afterwards, the club owner, and he said, you know, I'm Jewish. I said, really? I said, yeah, I don't really like to, to tell people this yeah, because there's still some strange feelings about Jews here in Poland. And this was probably the early 2000s, maybe? Something, or something. I said, really? He said, oh, yeah. You know, um, and I played another place in Poland, in Poznan, and the host, I, the, the people were beautiful, and I played in this very old building in the old town square. He told me, you know, the neighborhood you're staying in is the old Jewish quarter here, and uh, the Nazis turned one of the Jewish temples into a public uh, gymnasium swimming pool. And he said, I'm, I'm really ashamed that we haven't restored it to its original, to it should be restored. And he said, I'm ashamed of, of my country for not fixing the things that were done to the Jews, uh, mm. he apologized to me. I was like, you know, I wasn't asking him to, and he just right. felt terrible about it. And so you still find these things resonating. And uh, I had another experience in Germany while I was touring with Rabbi Abu Khalil and uh, yeah, with the crazy band Syrian and French and American and Lebanese. Um, we were playing in a jazz club in a city called Koblenz. And quite often when I was touring with Rabbi, I would call my father and say, you know, hey, Dad, you know, how are you doing? And, like, and he, of course, had been in World War II. He's still alive. He landed on D-Day in the afternoon, luckily. <laughs> That's why yeah. I'm sitting here uh, on uh, Omaha Beach. Wow. And uh, every place that I was playing that I visited with my harmonica, he had been with his gun, <laughs> you know. Mm. And it was just so weird to hear his memories of these places as opposed to my experiences of them with all these warm and welcoming and wonderful German people. Uh, and the uh, guy who was the head of the Copeland's Jazz Society uh, was a, a contemporary of my father's and he had been drafted into the German Air Force. He said, if I didn't go, they would have shot me. And he was a jazz lover. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing that he and his friends liked more than to listen to American jazz albums. Mm -hmm. They had to listen in secret because this was like Nazi propaganda that jazz was evil and degenerate and that Jews were involved in it and, it was, and they were as evil as degenerate as the blacks and they had all these horrible posters. I don't know if you've ever seen any of them. And, uh, really horrible. So this guy was really taking a big chance listening to these records. But he said the thing that he prized the most was if the German army had uh, captured an American position where they had s some of these V-discs that were made during the war, of, of recordings by everybody, you know, Benny Goodman and, and Louis, uh, Duke Ellington and Louis Armstrong and everybody, they would secretly get these records and secretly play them in someone's basement you know, and listen. And this is what they loved. And so, you know, this guy hated fighting. Wow. A and uh, I just thought, like, what would happen if he and my dad had met during the war at the opposite ends of rifles? Would oh, they have, these two music lovers, would they have killed each other? You know, I couldn't take it. I had to actually run out of the room, and I started to cry. Mm. Wow. Because he, there were very few Germans of that generation who were willing to openly discuss what they did in the war. Mm. And this guy said, this is, this is who I am, this is what I did. And as soon as the war ended, he started this jazz society to bring the very best jazz to this city. Wow. And it, it's probably still there. I don't know. Wow. There weren't certain tempos outlawed and... Yeah. Oh, yeah. And using mutes and trumpets. This was wow. a real big no-no. Wow. Degenerate sound, mm. you know. Wow. Oh, my gosh. So it's really weird to be in a place that, you know, has such a horrible past, uh, especially toward the people, toward Jews. Yeah. But to feel totally welcome now, I mean, uh, uh, and always. And the Motley crew that I was touring with, <laughs> I mean, it was really amazing uh, to, to go through these things. And I, Rabbi uh, told me I, I was the first Jew that he ever played music with. Maybe the first Jewish person he ever really got to know. Ah. And we just instantly hit it off. There was like no like, gap in personalities, culture, music 
everything. It just felt like wonderful from the first second we played together. Uh, oh, first played our first gig together in Athens in 1992, and then after I quit the Flectones, uh, it was 1991, that must have been, uh, I started getting all these calls uh, from Europe to play in these various different combinations of German uh, radio shows that, that had gatherings of musicians from all over the world, and Le Rabi hired me to play in his band, and I toured all over the world with him uh, for about f five years. It was an amazing experience. We wow. cut two, two albums together. One's called The Sultan's Picnic, and the other was called Odd Times. And he would write... <laughs> You know, the most tortured time meters, I mean, uh, mixed meters, multiple time meters. And he would always give me the solos in the most ridiculous ones, like 17 or 25 or stuff like that, you know. Uh, odd times <laughs> indeed. <laughs> exactly. And he knew I could do it. And, and, and I thought I could do it, so I did it. One of my other adventures in Germany, I was playing in a, a Jewish cultural center, someplace in Baden-Württemberg, I believe, a town called Freudenthal. And here's a book from this place. It was uh, actually all these histories of all the Jewish families who lived in this little village. And uh, it was a largely Jewish village. And of course, not good things happened to them. They didn't all die, but many of them did. And uh, the people, uh, the German people who lived there set up a cultural center and foundation and specialized in bringing in Jewish artists to play concerts there. Wow. So uh, one of the times I played there, I played there twice at least, um, uh, and I uh, sat in what used to be the old temple that they had restored, and I just felt this thing come over me, and I had to play this. We hope you enjoyed today's episode and hope that you'll join us back here next week. As a nonprofit, we can only afford to put on great programming like this thanks to your support. Please visit naranaarts.org for more information and to learn how to get involved.